You're in for a treat. I can honestly tell you that after talking with our speaker tonight for a brief period of time. A um, couple uh, points of order, please. If you haven't already done so, please turn off your cell phones. Um, that's point one. After the program, we'll have some refreshments. Uh, Amity will uh, sign copies of her book, uh, Coolidge, which she will show you here in a moment. And uh, we do have our temporary exhibit open upstairs on President Ford's uh, early life uh, called Growing Up Grand. So uh, welcome you to go up there for that. Um, Amity will sign copies out there in the, uh, in the uh, lobby. And there's a table set up there for her. Please buy the copy before you have her sign, OK? <laughs> I'm, I'm tired of losing part of my paycheck every time we have a book signing. Anyway, um, we, uh, this is kind of uh, wrapping up the 100th year of President Ford's birth. And uh, to be honest with you, I can't think of a better topic to end it on than Calvin Coolidge. Um, we've, we've had uh, Madeleine Albright here this year. You know we've had Jack Nicholas and so many other dignitaries throughout the year, but Calvin Coolidge uh, in many ways had a lot of President Ford's uh, economic policies, although Amity might disagree with me, but that's okay. Um, but right now, I want to introduce Gleese Whitney, uh, director of the Hohenstein Center for Presidential Studies and a great partner to both the uh, Ford Museum and the Gerald Ford Foundation which also helps make this uh, program and all of our other programs possible. So, please. Thank you so much, Jim. I want to uh, certainly weigh in on the partnership. We're very proud of the partnership we have here with the Ford Foundation and the Ford Library Museum. Uh, Acton Institute is also part of our partnership for this evening's program. And so we're really excited to have Amity Schleiss uh, speak with us this evening because she is so personable, so knowledgeable, and she combines a lot of great skills for a public performance like this. And I just want to tell you a little bit about her. Uh, she uh, comes to us from New York where she lives with her husband of 25 years. They raised four kids, two boys and two girls. Uh, in her education, she went to Yale, uh, magna cum laude, and uh, she went to the Free University in Berlin, talking a little bit about Germany earlier today. Uh, and she found herself, after graduating, writing uh, analysis and commentary, economic analysis and commentary, for such publications as the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Bloomberg. Currently, she writes a syndicated column for Forbes. She chairs the board of the Calvin Coolidge Foundation. She directs the 4% Growth Project at the Gerald, or at the, uh, what, Gerald R. Ford, I was about to say, since we're talking economics. No, but actually at the George W. Bush Center in Dallas. And she teaches at New York University Stern School of Business. They're in the MBA program. Well, tonight we're going to be her class. I'm looking really forward to this. I look forward to it because Amity's also got the gift of language. She was an English major at Yale. And you're going to find in her somebody who can tell a good story. Uh, it turns out that when Amity is not doing all the things that I just mentioned, she just happens to go and write bestsellers. And she's written three of them. She's written The Greedy Hand, The Forgotten Man. You may recall when we brought her in before and she gave a talk on The Forgotten Man. And tonight she's going to talk to us about her latest book, Coolidge. Please welcome Amity Schlaes. What, what a nice introduction. Um, I'm going to say thank you in the middle of the speech. <laughs> and raise your hand if you can't hear me. I, I was thinking about uh, coming here, uh, why should we care? Long ago, Coolidge, uh, and um, the proximate answer is the debate about spending. So you think of the debate about spending and you watch the politicians on TV and the debate is in such a wide range, right? 
on the question of spending, um, yay or nay. Uh, some people say, yes, we should spend now, and some people say, yes, we should spend a lot now. <laughs> oh. And, and what are the premises, or maybe uh, you could put another way, um, some people say we should spend now and some people say we should spend later. Again, very broad parameters, right? So what are the premises that underlie our, our, our decisions? Um, one is that America, especially particularly the federal government, has to spend to grow. If the government doesn't spend, if the Fed starts to curtail um, its, its buying in the market, well, the economy will fall off the cliff. Um, and the second is that even if we didn't want Washington to spend, we never could get someone elected who said no, right? Oh, that would never happen, right? We know it happened to Paul Ryan, right? Can't say no, right? Um, and if we did elect someone who said no to spending by the government, pretty soon he would get de-elected, wouldn't he? <laughs> because Americans only care about entitlements and so on. Um, and besides what? When we look at our history, we go to the museum here or anywhere, even Ronald Reagan increased spending, right? Eisenhower, everybody increased spending. Um, so maybe it's not possible to uh, cut spending, really. All you have to do, the best you can do, is pick someone who will, will spend less than the other guy. <sighs> the lesser evil and all that. We talk about that with our children and so on. Um, so in these short remarks tonight, I won't keep you so long, we have really only one thing, uh, one purpose, to say it's impossible, yes, for an American leader to say no even in the middle of prosperity, and to keep saying no, and to cut the budget, and not to hurt the economy, maybe to cause, um, I don't know, the Model A to be born, and uh, to get elected and be intensely popular. And the president to whom all this happened and who did all this was President Coolidge, the 30th president of the United States, um, my topic tonight. Um, and uh, you know, here we are at a presidential center and a presidential library, and we know that President Coolidge is an obscure president. He's not known as very good. He's kind of a seat warmer in the White House between the Roosevelts, right? One of those <laughs> people who you know, oh, goes pretty fast, even in AP history, you barely hear about him. You know he's supposed to have a sour face, right? Alice Roosevelt Longworth, the daughter of a more active kind of President Theodore Roosevelt said, he looked as though he'd been weaned on a pickle. <laughs> hey, maybe it was his teeth, right? This was before we had all our dentistry that we have now. Um, and uh, you know, you know the story about when he went to a party like we were just at with all the hors d'oeuvres, right? All the good food, the salmon, the little duck. What was that? A duck basket? I had a cute, very cute. Um, uh, everyone would try to chat him up, right? And you know the story about Coolidge, a very bright society lady said, President Coolidge, you're known as Silent Cal. Or maybe it was Vice President, Mr. Coolidge, I know you're known as Silent Cal, but I bet all the other ladies and gentlemen I could get you to say more than two words tonight. And you know what President Coolidge said? You lose, right? <laughs> So, you lose, so was, how could he be relevant? Well, um, here's how he could be relevant. I'm sorry, um, he served, I counted it up, and maybe Mr. Kratzis will correct me, because I'm not that precise. It seems to me that he served 67 months um, after President Harding died in the summer of 23 until the beginning of March 1929. All those months President Coolidge served. And the one fact you need to take away uh, for the current discussion is that when Coolidge left office, the federal budget was actually lower than when he came in. Wow. <laughs> So here we are, we think of, um, thinking of President Ford, thinking about this, we say, how do you do that, right? Was that, and we're very sophisticated, is that real amity or was that nominal? <laughs> it was actually real and nominal, they had deflation. Uh, was that per capita? 
Amity. Uh, actually, no, it was just like all that. He actually cut the budget. It was not as today we speak of a reduction in the increase of the, you know, the growth. He actually cut the budget. Oh my gosh, well, is that possible? Even as there were a miraculous number of new patents, not just automobiles, everyone was very happy all across the country and, and, and so on. Um, so I like him. If he's a Scrooge, he's the Scrooge who begat plenty. The hero you never knew you had, the forgotten president, Calvin Coolidge. And how did he do it? And I want to give some credit, because next year you're going to have the Harding revisionist before you, hopefully, right? Um, and President Harding before him. How did they do that? They cut the budget? That's a good topic. How they begat plenty, even as they cut the budget. These are good stories. They're stories of process and politics and history, but also of human temperament presidential temperament. And they take a minute to tell, and they have accents and imitations. So I'm grateful to Gleaves, my friend from the Howenstein Center, to Mr. Kratzos, I'll say Jim, to this wonderful presidential center um, for this time. And I should say to Ralph Howenstein and the Acton Institute, who are co-sponsor for, uh, for this time before you tonight, and to you for listening. So imagine a story, um, it's sort of like now, 1920, 1921. Well, why is 19, why are those years like now? One reason is they had inflation and they lied their heads off about it. <laughs> oh yeah, no inflation, just prices are going up here and there, like gas prices, food prices, and so on, but that doesn't count, right? Uh, two, they had more unemployment that they like to admit than they like to admit, especially among young people, right? They had cities that were failing here and there, but in the rest of the country, maybe some good spots, especially in one area called energy. Very much similar to now. Um, they had a concern that the progressive movement was on the rise and it would demand all kinds of radical things like the nationalization of health care. Hmm, sounds familiar. Um, they had just done a lot of strange things. For example, I didn't know until I went back to this period, I didn't learn this at Yale, that um, they nationalized the railroad during World War I and then they denationalized it just because they kind of felt like it. So that must have been kind of disruptive because at that time the railroad was like the internet. It was a really important industry. Um, and they shut down the stock market. Maybe you knew that for some reason or other. Then they unshut it down. So there had been all kinds of ruction in the US economy. Um, and a lot of people wanted the government to do more. We talked about the progressives, you know, Wisconsin, so on. Um, they had bad fiscal trouble, but the tax rate was already so high in the 70s. I mean, how much more could they tax? The debt had gone up to astronomical, unimagined levels, and the budget was much higher than anyone had ever thought. Yet, there were two groups seeking entitlements, what we would call entitlements. So there was a pressure for the government to say more and more, yes, in the 20s. And one, of course, were the farmers who did very well right after the war and then did poorly. As you know, ag prices, commodity prices went down 10, 20, 30 percent, and they wanted some kind of regular payment from the government to even that out. You've heard about Henry Wallace and the ever normal granary, right, in the seven years and fat and thin. They, so that's what the farmers wanted. And as you recall, a lot of Americans were farmers relative to now, one half, one third of the population on the farms, all voters wanting a relationship with Washington, a federal payment to flow automatically. And the second group that sought something from Washington, and again, they were bigger than they sound, were the veterans. And why were the veterans bigger? Well, there had been universal conscription in World War I. There were no antibiotics in World War I. One third of these men came back somehow disabled without the prospect necessarily of being all better ever? Did their wives work? No, their wives did not work. Um, so what kind of voter is that? That's a testy voter. And the veterans were asking for something that was actually not so unreasonable given our modern context, a pension, right? That's what the bonus, you've heard of the bonus march was. So they wanted a regular payment that they deserved given what had happened to them, or so they argued. So interesting part of the story, first of all, is that the one party 
the Republican Party nonetheless in 1920 doesn't run on saying yes to all these important constituent groups, but runs on no. You've heard of the motto of the 20 campaign, it was normalcy, and it's not an accident that normalcy starts with N-O. <laughs> And who were these fellows? Well, I just uh, spent some wonderful time with the descendants of Warren Harding in Cincinnati. It was first Warren Harding, the ebullient senator from Ohio, very much reminiscent, I would say, of President Clinton. <laughs> very much, in, in, quite lovable, quite intelligent, achieved a lot in some ways. And I, I would like a rebuttal to that, but that's who he reminds me of. And then, then secondly, of the, the um, Vice presidential candidate, a very a kind of tight fellow, uh, the governor of Massachusetts, Calvin Coolidge, you know, as vice presidential candidate, that's it. And normalcy, some of you are certainly teachers, I'm a teacher, I, some of you have children who took AP history, you took history. Normalcy, when you come across that in the textbook, you think, what a stupid phrase. They wanted people to be normal. Uh, that's not right. We want to be, you know, what, they wanted people to be cogs. That's un-American and uncreative. But when I went, go back and study what, what actually Harding meant by normalcy, it, it becomes more interesting. He wanted a normal policy environment so people could start companies. Oh, okay, that's begin to be creative, have fun. So that begins to be more interesting, normalcy. And Coolidge, uh, Coolidge was basically the equivalent of an English major, kind of a classicist, and he was never comfortable with this word normalcy. Uh, it sounds sort of like it mixes Greek and Latin, how sloppy, right? Oh, well, normalcy, I don't, what's the derivation of that? So he described what they saw in the 1920 campaign, the GOP, in another way. He said, we seek to reduce economic uncertainty. Oh, well, that begins to sound familiar, too. Very attractive, may I add. And number two, novelty is this pair, Harding Coolidge, wins on no change, right? Um, very, very um, interesting. And I want to read to you what the new president said in his inaugural address. This would be Harding, because it does sound so very like, I'm kidding, what a modern presidential um, arrival new president would say today. And it's true for either par party, by the way. Um, Mitch Daniels, I spoke to recently, the, re the governor of Indiana, and he said, um, Amity, Republicans have to call for action. You can't win unless you call for action, whatever party you're from. So here's what Harding said when he was inaugurated in 21. No altered system will work a miracle. Any wild experiment will add to confusion. Our best assurance lies in efficient administration of our proven system. Where's the change? Where's the experiment? Right? Very different new president from what we would get nowadays. An ability to say no, a willingness to be the plain old guy. Quite different, Harding. Number two, Harding did say no when he came into office at first. Um, he put the most activist Republican around him, who happened to be Herbert Hoover, um, out of the way by putting him in a harmless, distant office, that of Commerce Secretary, where he could do no harm, uh, and appointed a rather reductionist, quiet Treasury Secretary, Andrew Mellon. Harding had an interesting cabinet, some of it very bright. And he worked with his Senate brethren and passed a law, the Budget and Accounting Act of 1921, that gave the executive more authority to say no. What did that law, which is now gone, collateral damage of Watergate, do? It gave the chief executive, the president, the power to sequester, to impound even money already budgeted and signed off on, um, gave him a researcher uh, the forerunner to what we would think of as the OMB director, it gave us David Stockman, so to speak, and all his successors. Uh, it gave him the, because you can't say no unless you're informed, 
right? When your children come to you and say, I want a car, you have to say yes unless you've thought about it, right? So, so uh, it's easy to say yes when you don't know, but it's hard to say no when you're uninformed. So he would prepare um, with this budget director. That was his weapon. And second, what else did Harding do? You know, he said no to the farmers. He cut the budget back. He cut taxes down to 50. Um, he did a, he planned a worthy privatization project of, of energy, exactly what you would do if you had a government debt and some asset, in that case energy, you would sell it off. It sounded like something that the Reason Foundation would have planned, right? Um, but, and what about the vets? That's interesting too. He really didn't want to give an entitlement, a regular payment, so he cut an expensive compromise, well wrought. He would build hospitals for the vets. Um, okay, that's still better than a regular payment forever. But remember what I said about temperament? Harding was a complicated man. The Republican Party said no. The platform specific that he had said no. His own intention was to cut and say no. That was his brain. But his heart said yes. Harding was a friendly social guy and he had a lot of trouble saying no. He only vetoed six times. He didn't like to veto. He, uh, he didn't like, to, he appointed his friends. He didn't like to keep up appearances. Uh, he appointed his friends way too much. So uh, what happened with the worthy energy reserve privatization project? He gave it all to his friends and they sold it to their friends. And instead of a worthy example of privatization, like something Margaret Thatcher would do, what did it become? Teapot dome, right? Scandal. Because he, he did it so poorly. Um, with the vets, it was even worse. I looked into this for, for the book. And he had appointed a friend, Charles Forbes, to be in charge of the hospitals. And Mr. Forbes took lots of money and kickbacks instead of spending on the hospitals for the poor vets and ended up in Leavenworth Prison. Oh, well, that's embarrassing, and why do we care? We care because if the government is so corrupt that its VA hospitals are bad, well, then the case for the entitlement is that much stronger, isn't it? A direct check, right? So Alice Longworth said Harding was a slob. Unfortunately, it's true. People said they went to the Harding White House, quote, unquote, for food and action. In the time of prohibition, what's that mean? In the time of prohibition, mm -mm. And, 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 I, and, and some people thought that, that America should have recognized this sooner. One was Harding's father. Uh, the Hardings are all interesting people, mostly doctors. Harding's father uh, told a story about Harding that young people won't get, but I think you will get because it uses a, an older expression. He said it was a good thing Warren, President Harding, wasn't a girl because if Harding, the President Warren, were a girl, then he would always be in the family way. <laughs> oh. Okay, well, I'll leave it at that. This is the Coolidge speech, not the Harding speech. Um, and Harding kind of died of this inconsistency, a well-intended man who, who couldn't execute always. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we will leave it to the revisionists to come back. And in comes Coolidge, uh, summer of 23. Um, Coolidge was even, you know, less well-regarded than Harding. They said he was the accident of an accident. <laughs> and, um, you know, you're very good at politics here. You like presidents, so you're counting summer of 23. Well, when until the, when until the election? It's going to be November 24. It's a year plus only a little, what do you think, lame duck, right? That's what they thought about Coolidge, too. Um, but remember, again, what I said about temperament. And where Harding was divided, heart saying yes, brain saying no, Coolidge was all one. His heart said no as well. Every part of Coolidge was about budgeting. He'd always been that way since the time in Plymouth Notch when his father collected the snow tax, which his father did, right? His entire being, he believed, as president, had to correspond to his cutting, budgeting, austerity policy. You think I'm joking, and I know at a presidential library you inspect. I don't know, what was the name of President Ford's pet? Did President Ford have a good pet? Liberty, Liberty right? So usually you name an animal something 
something general or fun, you know, Barney, like that, right? What do you think Coolidge named the White House pets, which happened to be twin lion cubs who were a gift from the mayor of Johannesburg? He didn't name them Sweetie Pussy or anything. He named his twin pets, the lion cubs, Budget Bureau and Tax Reduction. <laughs> As if to say, you think I'm kidding. And, and there were twins, right? He wasn't any modern supply cider, so he didn't have a big fat kitty called tax reduction and a little bitty runt called budget bureau. He kept his lion cubs, even Steven, on steak because you can't cut the taxes unless you cut the budget. Cool, right? Um, he did come on like a sour pickle, not like a lame duck at all. I'm going to read you some Coolidge. It's really pretty, pretty mean. I am for economy, and after that, I am for more economy. <laughs> mm. Everyone thought things were just fine. Henry Ford and so on. Is he a guy going to relax or something? No, no, no. And I'm going to read what he said when they said relax, because the budget was already balanced, right? <clears throat> We must have no carelessness in our dealing with public property or the expenditure of public money because such a condition is characteristic of undeveloped people. <laughs> oh, that's not us, right? And then he proceeded to do his predecessor's job. Remember, he's following in upon the death of a president, sort of like President Ford. It wasn't a death, but it was a legacy, much like President Johnson after the death of President Kennedy, which we think about in this season. Coolidge proceeded to do what Harding had planned and dedicated himself to doing it, quote unquote, to perfection. <laughs> taxes, well, taxes were going down 58%. That was too high. He was going to get them down to 25%. And he worked with um, the Treasury Secretary, Harding's Treasury Secretary, continuity, Andrew Mellon. And Mellon was also taciturn, so you want to imagine how they had a tax campaign that lasted several years if neither of them talked. Hmm. Well, it was said that Mellon of Pittsburgh and Calvin Coolidge of Massachusetts and Vermont conversed in pauses. <laughs> this was their this wasn't just a little bitty campaign. This was their desert shield, desert storm. It went on and on. Um, they especially wanted to flatten the schedule, get it down. They thought they could get great growth with that. Um, Me uh, Mellon had this idea from the railroad industry, the one that had been destroyed by the progressives. The idea was the following. If you charge low freight, maybe you get more traffic. Low toll, right? You should charge what the traffic will bear. This would be, um, in modern languages, would be the Walmart principle. You don't make much profit on when you cut the price, but you make it up on the volume of sales. So Mellon, a formidable businessman, perhaps America's greatest, applied this to taxes. Cut the tax rate. <gasps> you might get more money. This idea made Calvin Coolidge, I might add, profoundly uncomfortable. Why? If you cut the tax rate, well, what if Mellon was wrong? You might not get more money. Then you'd have a <gasps> deficit. That's not good, right? But even worse, what if you cut the tax rate and you got more money? Well, you know what would happen then, right? The Democrats would spend it. <laughs> Not happy with this idea, but he was a very great delegator, so he went along with the scientific taxation, which is the name Mellon gave this process. Budget, this is an amazing display by Coolidge, where he was wholly comfortable. He budgeted not only well, but ruthlessly. It, for this book, we quantified how many times he met with his budget advisor, his David Stockman. He always met with him before the cabinet meeting. So you see 20, 30, 40 times in a year, even late into the presidency, and presidents do get tired and kind of give up. So that was very interesting. He knew the importance of the discipline of preparation. And at his meetings, and he would have a meeting like this with the cabinet and their staff twice a year. And they're actually in the University of Michigan archive, the, the transcripts of these meetings, if you ever want to look them up. Coolidge would talk to the government about how the government, the executive branch, should cut. 
And it, it, again, it's in tones that we wouldn't use today. He worked with his budget director, who was named General Lord from Maine. And them being both New Englanders, they used New England metaphors. And they get, created a prize for the government departments that voluntarily, in addition to the cuts demanded, cut their budgets 3%. And then, mm, voluntarily. And then you get what? A sticker? Right? <laughs> And after a while, you know, the government, the, the country's growing, so it's hard for the government to cut. So they created a prize for the department that cut its budget 2%. And then they created a prize for the department that cut its budget 1%. And then they had to create a prize. They couldn't even get 1% for the department. Remember, they're New Englanders, so they used a New England metaphor that was like a woodpecker and pecked away at its budget here and there. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, if a department was, uh, Coolidge reckoned that um, the government was using $175,000 worth of pencils, and he reckoned it could be 150 or 125. I'll, you have two pencils. I'll take my stub back. A very different culture, half battleship back. Um, you know, more, uh, I don't think it's more significantly, but more obviously he cut budgets in another way by pre preventing laws. He, he had written his father long ago when he was a lawmaker in Massachusetts and his father was still, uh, or again, a lawmaker in Vermont. It's better to kill a bad law than to sign a good one. Very interesting. Give administration a chance to catch up with legislation. Didn't like laws. And so Harding, I mentioned it vetoed six times. Coolidge vetoed 50. You, you're, you know, people always think, what's the vulnerable area of an executive? One area would be farming. The Coolidges were farmers in this pathetic region, Vermont, all rocky. Can you imagine a village of farmers? Later, the Agriculture Department comes along and reckons that Plymouth Notch, the Coolidge birthplace, not one acre of it is arable. And they're all farmers, right? His father had a cheese factory. What's a cheese factory in a time like that? An exercise in economic desperation. You can't, no train comes to Plymouth Notch. The grade is too steep. No power came to Plymouth Notch. They just didn't get there. So you have to make your milk, right, your protein, get it to Boston somehow. So they thought Coolidge would say yes on agriculture subsidy. And there's a famous, famous scene where um, an authority named Cooper comes in and begs him for ag sub subsidy. And I'm going to play Coolidge and say, please, Mr. Coolidge, agriculture subsidy, Coolidge. Well, farmers never have made much money. Pause. Don't suppose they ever will. <laughs> Pause. Don't suppose there's much the government can do about it. Pause. Great ability to say no, even in areas of vulnerability. Um, remember what I said about temperament? Uh, temperament affects which legislative device an executive will use, and I know Mr. Kratz has probably done a study of this. So you can guess which legislative device Coolidge really loved, being a silent type, the pocket veto. What's, you know, the pocket veto wasn't used very much right then. Uh, you have to kind of trick Congress a little bit into passing something close to recess. Then in recess, what? By inaction, you, you sit on it and you kill it. Why did he like it? When you do a pocket veto, you don't have to write any message. <laughs> Plus, they can't override it. They have to start over and write a whole new law. Oh, that's very, very efficient, right? Coolidge was, a, was not just a master of the pocket veto, he was a regular Isaac Stern of the pocket veto. He pocket vetoed here and there. And by the way, and I like to research this, he saw to it, I would say, that the Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of his favorite tool, the pocket veto. Oh my goodness, so that's very interesting. That was important too. Uh, we tend to speak of pork figuratively, pork this, that, right? It means earmark or something. In the, you, you look at Coolidge's personal life, which is a good story, and you'll see that um, pork was also there in terms of saving literally. There was a housekeeper at the White House who'd been there since the Tafts, 
named Mrs. Jaffrey, and she was very fancy, and she went to all the specialty shops in, with a horse and carriage, a broom. And President Coolidge was suspicious of this. He thought she should go to the Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> Economy of scale. Um, and they kind of came to blows, the end of Mrs. Jaffray at the White House when she had a big spread like we had tonight and all the dinner for foreign diplomats and she got the president, Mr. President, she's so proud. She wants to show him what she's laid out and all President Coolidge said is it looked like an awful lot of ham to him to serve and uh, Mrs. Jaffray was soon gone and uh, they got, uh, well, somebody else from New England who wrote down every olive in a little book that was spent bought at the White House, uh, Miss Riley. And we know this story, people aren't pleased by events like this because Mrs. Jaffray went and wrote a tell-all in Cosmopolitan. <laughs> about how stingy President Coolidge was. Um, and he was stingy. Uh, you, in, uh, you think of the MasterCard commercial, right? Vis-a-vis -vis presidents. Uh, what's running into the president at a meeting worth? Pretty good, right? No matter what party you're with, you want to meet the president. What's a pretty small meeting with the president like? Well, that's great, right? What's a private breakfast with the president at the White House? Priceless, right? Ooh, we want that, right? Well, so it's curious about Coolidge, as he said, no so much. Eventually, they didn't want those priceless breakfasts with his maple syrup from Vermont and so on. And, his, um, and the, even the most important lawmakers would, would turn down the president um, when he invited them to the White House. And another angry employee at the White House, this time it was the usher, Mr. Ike Hoover, who didn't get very good tips. The Coolidge's did not tip like the Wilsons. Um, kept an, a list in a sort of malicious way of all the negative RSVPs poor President Coolidge got when he invited lawmakers to, to have breakfast with him. And I'm going to read those RSVPs to you. Um, please come to the White House, Senator Heflin. Regrets. Sick. <laughs> okay. Senator Pittman. Regrets. Sick. I like this one. Senator Reed of Missouri, regrets, sick friend. <laughs> and then this is the prize. Senator Norris, the progressive from the great Northwest, unable to locate. <laughs> but what's going on? I think some in Washington recognized what Coolidge was doing, the value of it in terms of saving. One was the journalist Walter Lippmann, who didn't particularly like him. And I'll read you what Lippmann told the country in his writings about what Coolidge was doing by saying no. This White House is extremely sensitive to the first symptom of any desire on the part of Congress or of executive departments to want to do something. The skill with which Mr. Coolidge applies his wet blanket is technically marvelous. <laughs> there has never been Coolidge's equal in the art of deflating interest. Well, the naive statesman is, imagines it's desirable to interest the people in their government that indignation at evil is useful. Mr. Coolidge is more sophisticated. He has discovered the value of diverting attention from the government and with an exquisite subtlety that amounts to genius, he uses dullness and boredom as political device. <laughs> Well, what are the takeaways for us now? One, temperament does matter. Two, character does matter. Coolidge knew it wasn't easy to say no. In my biography, you can see how painful it was for him to say no. <coughs> Three, laws matter. The Budget and Accounting Act of 1921 is gone now. Maybe we should restore it. <coughs> I'm just going to drink some of this. I think also federalism matters. He respected states. That's where the spending should be, he thought. Uh, he's a ferocious federalist. No saying was good for the economy. What a tremendous economy they had. I, I run this project at the Bush Center, George W. Bush Presidential Center, called 4% Growth Project. Frankly, 4% growth is aspirational because we don't have it. <laughs> 
That's what we want to have. We want to educate people about how we get policy that gets us to that. And you think about President Kennedy, he had a 5% growth target, and we consider that sort of impossible. Now, that's a developed nation, a developing nation's level. We can't have that, right? Coolidge did have 4% real growth. Well, that's very interesting. And with incredible innovation, the, the patent rate in the 20s is totally enviable. There's a wonderful new book about it by a scholar named Alexander Field. There's almost nothing comparable to the level of innovation of the 20s. Um, I think political trust is important. What Coolidge was doing by being so tight was restoring um, some of the shine to the presidency, the office that had been tarnished, unfortunately, by Harding. People sort of trusted him because he did what he said he would, even if it wasn't pleasant always. And that, in turn, enabled him to cut those taxes. His, he, you know, his marginal tax rate was lower than Reagan's. You'd really want to, I want to underscore that, 25. But he couldn't have done that without a lot of political trust, including from some of his political opponents. Uh, Scrooge can win elections. In 1924, Coolidge did run for president. There was a large progressive party, progressive movement growing. You know La Follette, that was his high point, sort of a Ross Perot. Um, and Anderson, and usually when progressives or a third party do well, that's bad for Republicans, whether Theodore Roosevelt right, ran and therefore Taft lost and Wilson won. Perot ran, that helped Clinton, the Republican lost, right? In Coolidge's case, he beat the progressive, even though the progressive got 17% of the vote, and the Democrat combined to take an absolute majority in 24. How do you do that? Well, how do you do that? It, you can't do it without popularity. It wasn't just the support of Henry Ford. It was that the country saw that his policy of no and less government meant more yes in the private sector. I think, uh, and when Coolidge didn't run in 28, he chose not to run like Lord Acton, absolute power corrupts absolutely. I mean, he practically said that in his autobiography. Um, the, the Republican Party, neurotic as now, had a nervous breakdown. Nobody can run but Coolidge. He's the only one in Hoover, who was very different type, quite activist, had to promise to run on Coolidge policy. Enormous political success. So I'm ready for your questions. I know one will be, didn't he cause the depression? And here, like Coolidge, I'll be monosyllabic and just say, no. <laughs> But we can go on. Um, and the second is, isn't today different and we're all entitled and so on, and our children expect so much and blah, blah. Um, I don't think so. Uh, I do, uh, you know, recently Mrs. Thatcher died, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, you never, I'm sure the Tory party never thought they'd have such a tough, strong, austerity lady at their head just a few years before. But they did get her, and she did achieve a lot, and she was very successful politically. So in this long speech about no, when you ask at the very end, is it possible to ever have, have a no-sayer, I'm going to change direction and say as I close, yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Raise your hand high, because I can't see that well. I have to change glasses. Uh, the lady in pink. I understand that there are some skeletons in Coolidge's closet. Would you like to enlarge it on that? Well, yes, we found some skeletons in Coolidge's closet. Um, it was terrible. Uh, in Coolidge's autobiography, he wrote about how everyone in his family paid their bills, but we all know people in our family who don't pay their bills. And he, there were some Coolidge's who didn't pay their bills. We found in the archive Uncle Oliver, very American story, actually went to jail for debt. And he was in Woodstock Common Jail in Woodstock, Vermont, which is near, um, and there he wrote, in quatrains, a curse upon the more sanctimonious cousins and brothers who were not bailing him out. <laughs> um, and Oliver was 62, and he had numerous children, and so on and so forth. And you would think he would die in Woodstock Jail. Um, this was around the time of Charles Dickens, right? But it's a very American story. What Oliver did not die. Instead, he went to Wisconsin. 
And with that, those other Coolidges, some of them changed their name because of the shame. Uh, they settled there and some moved to Minnesota. And actually when Coolidge came out here, he didn't come to Michigan, but he did go to Wisconsin on vacation. He sought some of them out and he spent some money to make their graves nicer and so on. And I do think he realized uh, very, very clearly um, the cost of debt. Uh, and it was not out of hostility to debtors, but rather love and affection for people that he sought to keep people from debt. He didn't always oppose, um, you know, buying on installment because he saw that sometimes you need to do that, but he also saw the damage. So his sort of life is sort of an economic journey where he's always thinking about debt. And Oliver, the question is whether how much he knew about Oliver. One of the things this old Oliver Coolidge lost was the thing, um, it was a, la uh, a sugar lot. It was called a sugar lot. It was known as the lime kiln lot. It's still there, we take children there. And so that, one of the reasons Oliver was angry was his, his more prosperous brother, somehow it reverted to the prosperous brother. So Coolidge inherited the foreclosed lime kiln lot. And he, it's in the family to this day. He took his sons there. And this was the loss of an uncle that had, was his benefit. And I could never figure out how, if Coolidge knew exactly where it was from because it was um, lost by the uncle before his birth. So we don't know exactly what his father told him. But we do know he greatly feared debt. Uh, yeah? Did he, did he fear debt also with foreign nations? What about this foreign policy? Did it lead to the rise of the dictators that we see in the 20s and 30s? Um, I, I don't think so. I mean, how much easier could we... The, he didn't write the Versailles Treaty. He didn't write that, right? Um, Mellon probably... I'm just thinking, trying to think what Mellon said about Versailles, so, so I don't want to speculate. That Mellon's whole policy was that it's better for the European nations to have their terms rearranged than for them to default. It's better for us and better for them, just as now. So Mellon, you can see the interest rates going down all through the 20s vis-a-vis -vis the European nations because they're constantly refinancing them or financing them. And the Coolidges were just these people from Massachusetts and Vermont, and yet they were constantly hosting European leaders, the Queen of Romania, right? Um, uh, you know, the king's speech, that king, right? Uh, they, 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 but when he uh, came over here, um, and why were they coming over here? To get their terms eased, always. It was about the debt. And Mellon lowered interest rates in order to ease the terms of the Europeans in order to preclude world war. Indeed, he was criticized. I mean, if you look at John Kenneth Galbraith or so on, they'll say the interest rates here were too low because, and therefore the boom, and therefore, and definitely they saw a trade-off. Well, the stock market might go up when we lower interest rates, but what's more important is to help Europe to pay off its debt. So I, can't, I don't think I would hang that on Coolidge because they did ease interest rates maybe a bit too much, but you want to remember those easy interest rates, which are so often criticized and give us images of Champagne and Great Gatsby and so on, were, what, 3 4 5%? So if we think their interest rates were easy and bubbless and portending disaster and crash, what are our interest rates now? Yeah. Who or what influenced his political thinking? Very interesting question. Depends who you ask. George Washington, very much. He read a lot of classics, uh, Cincinnatus. I mean, he read oratory in Latin. A lot of material um, about Rome and political corruption. Uh, he read Dante. He tried to translate Dante for his bride, the most beautiful grace. He was pretty good in Italian and <laughs> strong in Latin and Greek. Um, some people, if you have another lecture here, they'll say he was influenced by a teacher called Charles Edward Garman who taught at Amherst. It's definitely true. He's influenced by Garman. Uh, when I turn to Garman, I find murky material. <laughs> Garman, I, I don't see sort of a little bit like Thomas Hardy, a little bit. I mean, he's okay. I think Garman, the main thing about Garman was he was a great, gifted classroom teacher. And he brought the kids out and brought out Coolidge at a time. Coolidge was a shy young man. Um, Burke, definitely. 
you see Burke all the time. Um, I can't find Acton, though I wish I could, but you do see Washington, Washington's decision to go back to the plow uh, very much. Um, was started out Coolidge as a regular Republican, uh, which meant the Republicans were the Progressive Party, was gradually grossed out by the Republicans. Uh, though the, especially the activist ones and became a conservative Republican that is a more traditional one. He had a, a mentor called Murray Crane, who was a senator in Western Massachusetts. Coolidge didn't think he was a New England blue blood. He was from the Western part. The Coolidge's in Boston, the people with his name wouldn't even speak to him because he wasn't fancy enough. They were related to Thomas Jefferson on the other side and so on and taught at Harvard. And he, he thought of himself, they thought of him as sort of a, a swamp Coolidge, a backwoods western Coolidge, if you can imagine it. And, and um, they were nasty to him. So I wouldn't include Henry Gab Cabot Lodge, who knew much fancier Coolidge's, this, this dean uh, from Boston of the political core. Uh, Cabot Lodge was really rude to Coolidge. He said, I knew Coolidge when it was necessary to know him, but not <laughs> great, right? Um, so, so, uh, but Crane was Western Mass, also very silent, also had red hair. And uh, Crane, had, Crane was not a scholar. Uh, he had a paper company, you know, Crane's Stationery. And he made the paper on which the US dollar was printed. And he had a great respect for for a stable currency. And that you pick up in Coolidge too. So the, they were Republicans. They were sort of default Congregationalists, the Coolidges. They were not rich. And they thought of themselves, you're going to laugh, of Vermont and Western Mass as Westerners. <laughs> OK. Is it? One more? Can't see. Wave your arm really wildly. This person, yeah, blind. Uh, oh, well, they certainly got on board with it then because they saw that when the government practiced austerity, the private sector gave plenty. So pretty fast. I mean, if you read like the Linz, uh, the sociology of the 20s, Middletown, how much incredible improvement there was for the middle class. That's what I resent about the Gatsby um, stereotype, which is that it was all the wealthy. If you look at the 20s, what is the ultimate definition when we think of a developing country of becoming middle class, getting electricity? The 20s were the decade where that happened. India, what is the ultimate definition? Page one newspaper story of when someone becomes middle class. It's when they get an indoor toilet. I'm sorry, that's it. When did Americans begin to get indoor toilets? More than one or two in 10? The 20s. I rest my case. The 20s were a great decade for the middle class. Um, so, so they saw that and they voted for him. This was deeply mocked by the intellectuals. You know, people wrote whole books mocking Coolidge. Sinclair Lewis, the man who knew Coolidge, right? Babbitt, that was Coolidge. But, but um, Coolidge was a Rotarian type. You couldn't think of an insult worse among the intellectuals. Well, the Rotarians were really impressive. That's the thing. That's our culture. It, and, and he represented that, and they knew it. Um, do I think it's possible now? Absolutely. Do I have respect for young people, or are they all lazy pigs? I have complete respect for them. Um, do, uh, we all, uh, the, and why don't they act more? Because the interest rate has not crossed 5% yet. When will the interest rate cross 5%? Certainly soon. No matter what they say on Bloomberg TV, <laughs> when it crosses 5% and the young people realize what it's like to buy a house at 10 or 15, as it, you know, what it was in the 80s, they will all be Coolidge fans. It's just, our job is to put the heroes in place so when the moment comes and the interest rate crosses 5%, they, there is a hero for them. It, it, we're kind of anesthetized, that is. It's, we're, it's like a, a patient who keeps getting transfusion after transfusion, so he feels good for a few hours by the current Fed policy. That doesn't mean it will work forever, or it doesn't mean, most importantly, that it, that it addresses the underlying condition of the patient, which may have nothing at all to do with blood transfusion, right? Maybe endocrine. It may be 
an infection. And so on. So, so uh, politically, it's very hard to argue for savings when the Fed is behaving as it is currently. That doesn't mean Americans don't value savings. Or, yeah? Uh, way back, waving by the window, practically. Um, how do you, you mentioned Anne a couple times. How do you think Coolidge would respond to the idea of Anne before that? Mm-hmm. Wait, I can't hear you. I mentioned who? Uh, you mentioned, mentioned patents a couple times. Patents, yes. Yeah. How do you think Coolidge would respond to the idea of patent <clears throat> Patent. Uh, reform. Well, he liked property rights, so he would go with the trolls. The 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 law, you know he would be more on the end of it of defending patents. Um, that's because he saw that when people own things, they're willing to invest in them. Uh, way way over there on property rights. Yeah. Oh, very interesting question. One, he thought, what was Coolidge's attitude towards the Fed? One, remember it was new, so they didn't really know what it was. Two, it had a different law. The modern Fed law was only passed in the 1930s in the period of Mariner Eccles. Um, Three, he thought that was uh, not his department. Um, It's the department of, then the Treasury had more to do with the Fed. It was Andy Mellon's department. It was the Department of the Fed. Should the executive intervene? Probably not. Mm. What happens if the Fed is too easy or too tight? Well, the market pays and the Fed learns a lesson and it's wiser next time. He never thought that the executive should get involved, nor probably did he think the Fed should manage economic growth or employment. That, that mandate of the Fed only came later. Did he expect the market to crash in 29? You bet. Did he think that, that he should intervene? Absolutely not. Why? If the market had crashed numerous times in the life of Coolidge. His adult life parallels the life of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So you can see it very neatly. Never after a big crash did they have any old 11-year Great Depression. So he didn't expect it. And I would argue, uh, that's the basis of my book, The Forgotten Man, that, that the Coolidge policy would not have caused an 11-year um, Great Depression with no return of the market and double-digit unemployment the whole time. Um, he, but he would have let the market crash for sure. Uh, he thought the market had to learn from its own mistakes. Remember, at, in Coolidge time as well, there was no SEC either. It was the state of Massachusetts that regulated Mr. Ponzi. Charles Ponzi, not Washington. Um, so it was a, a completely different culture, uh, and one could argue a more interesting one, maybe even a more virtuous one. Yeah. So you said that Coolidge's recasting of uh, Harding was not a returning the country to normalcy, but that he wanted to reduce economic uncertainty. I assume that what he meant by that was that he wanted the policy environment to be stable, the rules to be stable as it were. But you can imagine uh, people sort of taking that to mean, well, we want uh, reduced uncertainty too, as the farmer. We want uh, our regular income and so forth. Was there, did he see any tension in that, do you think? Oh, oh, oh completely. Explain? Oh, oh, completely. You know, when you call for less economic uncertainty, you can be for Obamacare and cast it as less economic uncertainty. Everybody's insured, right? Um, so it, uncertainty is a, an imperfect ideal. You know, we're reducing uncertainty. But, it, but it's of value sometimes. Vis-a-vis farms, uh, Coolidge, I would say, he, you know, he didn't want subsidy, so he deemed that less uncertainty. You know, you had to deal with prices, that might be more uncertain. And, uh, you know, if you want to poke holes, I think that's an area where you can poke a hole. That's where the conservative in him trumped the ins- uncertainty reducer in him. An area where he's even more vulnerable is in the tariff. The GOP was for the tariff. Okay, th- that causes a lot of uncertainty because they're always resetting the tariff all the time. <laughs> So he got himself into a position where he said, I'm not really wild about tariffs, but we just have to settle the tariff because there'll be less economic uncertainty. 
you know, that's the imperfection of, of reducing uncertainty as a policy goal. So, but basically, if he's a smaller government person, and when there's less government, there's less uncertainty, that's consistent because the government can do less, and that part is whole and valuable. There's a professor at the University of Chicago, um, Davis, who just made a new uncertainty index, and it does suggest that the stock market goes up when there's less policy uncertainty. So, I mean, this is a value to all of us. You know, when the government, you know, you look at the Fed now, uh, engages in wild behavior, everyone freezes and sometimes does nothing. So it, it's not perfect, but it, sometimes it's a value. Yeah, I, I, I thought about that too. And Coolidge Certainty, he was deeply ambivalent about the farming because he was from this farming background. But on balance, he thought less uncertainty meant less intervention, less subsidy. Yeah. A uh, question regarding the uh, uh, what uh, the, the relationship between the, 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 the strike from Boston police officers and uh, how Reagan handled the air traffic control situation. Um, what was the relationship? Uh, what was I don't know. Uh, does anyone know how much Reagan thought about Coolidge when it came to firing Paco air traffic controllers? <laughs> Did he cite him? I only bring this up only for the fact that Charles Johnson's book, uh, Why Coolidge Matters, I decided that. I just wanted to. No, it happened that Reagan fired the air traffic controllers. And it happened that Reagan admired Coolidge. In fact, um, I, we know that Reagan read one of the biographies of Coolidge by Fees, F-U-E-S-S, after the uh, attempt on him where he was shot. I've, I personally, but it's probably ignorance, have never come across Reagan saying, Coolidge did this with bad unions. Um, but the background, just so people know, is um, there was a, a, the dr most dramatic stories of Coolidge's life I didn't even tell. Um, when he was still governor, there was a union. It was the police union. They were nice policemen. They were underpaid. The government was lying about inflation. They w had no colas. Their horses were lovely. Uh, they had served in World War I. They were Irish, which was Coolidge's best constituency. He was famous at getting the Irish vote. And they went on strike. They lined up not with the Wobblies and the Communists, but with the reasonable AF of L, which was best friends with President Wilson. And they went on strike and, you know, affiliated. And uh, there was chaos in Boston. And the guard had to be called out. And Coolidge fired them all. There's no right to strike against the public safety by anyone, anywhere, anytime. Was he upset? Yes, he got bronchitis. Did he think he would be reelected? His election was just weeks and weeks away. It was the autumn. In those days, the governor of Mass was elected every year. He did not think he would be reelected. Re was he sad? You bet. Did the horses whinny after the policemen like, I don't know what, the Budweiser commercial when they saw them on the street? Yes, they did. It was terrible. What a human interest story. Were the policemen nice? Totally. Were they wronged? But Coolidge took this policy decision, drew a difficult line in the sand. It was incredibly good for the country because after that, the public sector unions didn't go on strike so much. And that was one feature in the 20s. In the 20s, you actually see wages rise as union membership drops. Mm. Mm, very interesting, right? So it was, a, it was pretty admirable as a decade, and that was in part because of the president sent by governor, set by Governor Coolidge. Did definitely, he says it in his autobiography, without a doubt catapult him to national prominence because he had upstaged a sitting president, Wilson, who was waffling on the issue. Mm, look, at, just a, look at that governor. We have that phenomenon now. But I never found Reagan citing Coolidge on that. And I'd like to see it, and it would be fun. Um, I've seen Reagan cite Coolidge on cutting the marginal tax rate below Reagan's rate to 25, which Coolidge did. Yeah, we're going to stop soon, right? Yeah, uh, right. President Coolidge appointed Harlan Fisk Stone to the Supreme Court, and Stone became one of the big supporters of the New Deal. Do you think that Coolidge would have Felt betrayed by that, or do you think you would have supported this as, as a judicial restraint that he, that he would be in favor? Well, who feels betrayed by, by Justice Roberts? 
<laughs> Who feels betrayed by, you know, the better part, the better part of valor post-presidency is silence, right? Um, I, I, you know, I, I, the, what about Harlan Stone? What about, what about, what about, you pick someone with the best credentials, this is the danger of credentials, right? Because you can get them confirmed. In the case of Coolidge, um, it's a very interesting story. He was friends with Harlan Fisk Stone. They went to Amherst. Stone was not in a fraternity by choice. Amherst was an incredibly Greek school. 80% of Amherst was in a fraternity. And Harlan turned his back on that, and um, Coolidge admired that, because Coolidge wanted to be a fr in a fraternity and didn't get into any fraternity. Mm -hmm. And so then he could, could you know, walk with pride and say, I'm like Harlan Stone, I choose not. Uh, very late, in the end, Coolidge went in a fraternity. So, um, but uh, Harlan was like that, very uh, good, uh, um, and also I believe um, maybe went to Columbia Law School, right? Harlan and uh, Coolidge didn't go to law school. His father didn't really want to pay for law school. So Coolidge read the law. And he was always kind of um, respectful of his friends like Dwight Morrow and Harlan who, who went to law school. Uh, and he respected Harlan. He was a debater and Harlan was a bit ahead in school and was a successful debater. So there was that admiration and respect. And he saw Harlan was quite independent. Um, remember, this is a time when, when Harding had been, you know, corruption. And Harlan went his own way, and uh, a, he was attorney general before he was a, a justice. And he helped to clean it up, though he did uh, put, you know, J. Edgar Hoover in a job. So I think it's all about that, you know, at the time, a fellow Amherst person, a person respected, a person seemingly independent. And I don't know if uh, Coolidge could ever have envisioned that Stone would do this, but he probably would have laid the blame anyway on the Roosevelt administration, which put through the gosh darn legislation, uh, which is the Social Security law or whatever. Um, Last question. Yeah. I would like to know how Coolidge was influenced by the Henry Fords, the Rockefellers, and the Carnegie. He uh, Carnegie, the thing about the Carnegies that influenced Coolidge most was definitely the libraries. The libraries. He, he did his law study in a library of a Carnegie-like figure, the Forbes Library, a uh, Judge Forbes in Northampton, used, saved his pennies and built a library. And that's, Coolidge loved that library so much he gave a lot of his material to it in Northampton. It's where Smith is. Um, the, the Mellons influenced him quite a bit. Um, the Fords, well, he didn't really like Ford cars. Um, you know, uh, you can see that in his writing. Um, but he had respect for Henry Ford. Uh, Ford uh, famously visited him in the summer of 1924, not long after his son Calvin died. And he gave Ford a sap bucket from his farm with the Coolidge name on the bottom. And that sap bucket is in an inn, I believe in Sudbury, Mass, that, um, that Ford, one of his Americana things, he bought up that inn, sort of like, you know, in Dearborn and all the... Uh, and they had a great conversation, and Thomas Edison was there. Coolidge respected entrepreneurship. I don't think he was bought out by it, though, not bought out by these great companies. Um, in the period when he ran for president, they were supporting the Lincoln Highway. Do you remember the Lincoln Highway? Um, which was kind of more organic and less federal, right? More states. And Coolidge wasn't even sure that the federal government should build highways. So th that's quite interesting. Yeah. Let's give Andy Schleiz a hand. I say anybody who can imitate Warren Harding as well as she does deserves a Ralph Hallenstein swag bag. Just a reminder, there is a reception out there in the lobby and also Amity's agreed to sign your books, so uh, get ready.